Hello, everybody. <laughs> Can you hear us? Hang on. Yeah, All right. Yes. <laughs> we can't hear you. <laughs> well, welcome uh, to tonight's Hump Day Hanger presentation uh, presented by supercup.org and the Not So Straight Level podcast. Tonight, Laura and I are doing a semi-encore presentation that we did for the Minnesota Pilots Association uh, in 2019 on our trip to the Bahamas. And uh, we added a few pictures and changed a few things up and got a little updated information for you. And we're not singing, so we're sparing you. That's right. <laughs> we, we wrote a special song last time for it, and we're not doing that this time. So. No. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so we're going to jump right into the presentation. Let me move a few things out of the screen <laughs> here so we can see what we're doing. All right. So what are the goals of this presentation tonight? Why the Bahamas? Dispel any fear and build confidence? Review the requirements? Uh, explain planning and preparation? Uh, review the plan, execution, and see pretty pictures and questions and answers. That's all there is to it. <laughs> so the first question always comes up, why the Bahamas? And the answer to that is these, these people. people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we had never discussed uh, going to the Bahamas before, flying to the Bahamas, um, just really was not even on our radar. And then about two years before the trip, our friends Alan and Jill Messler asked us if we'd like to go. We said, yes, <laughs> why not? And then six months later, uh, an email showed up with the <laughs> reservations and the deposits <laughs> and all those things that we needed to do. And it, then things started. So uh, we had to quickly figure out if we were going to go or not, which we ended up doing. And, and get everything uh, in order. <laughs> and Alan and Jill were fantastic guides. They have oh, been yeah. many times, have gone every other year. So they're, they're a great couple to go with. And a lot of fun. And we went with two other wonderful couples as well, yes. all in sky wagons. <laughs> so there was plenty of other reasons. It's not as far as you think. There are super nice beaches. It's very aviation friendly. The smaller islands are very relaxed. It's English speaking. But most, maybe most importantly, you can swim with the pigs. <laughs> We chose not to. You have to make your own decision on that one. <laughs> it just wasn't going to happen. It was something about the fact that they sort of eat and do everything else in the same water there <laughs> that kind of discouraged us from swimming at them. But they are very cute. And they're all on one beach there uh, in the Exumas, actually. <laughs> so something that uh, we mispronounce all the time is the word key. It's spelled K. It's really easy to pronounce it as K. I have to train myself, but all of those little islands are called Keys. And uh, that's basically what the Bahamas are made up of. There's a whole bunch of little teeny islands all kind of connected together. A couple big ones, but uh, makes for some absolutely spectacular flying as I hope you'll see from some of these photos. But now we've got this. Ooh, lots of fears. But one very, very important one. Right there. <laughs> so the most important fear that you have to be concerned about on this trip is lycantophobia. Now, lycantophobia is a rare condition that exists only in about <laughs> one tenth of, the, of a percent of the population <laughs> where a person hears things that are not really there when faced with large expanses of forest or over open water. <laughs> so the other fear and one of the things we did some research on and uh, talked a lot about, uh, just because we hadn't thought a lot about it, was ditching. And uh, Paul Bertarelli, who you know from AvWeb and Aviation Consumer and Aviation Safety, uh, 
prolific author um, and, and, and a researcher, wrote a really great article for Equip to Survive. And the link is there at the bottom of the screen. If you ever want to read about ditching and don't know much about it, it is really uh, eye-opening that the survival rate at around 90% in all ditching cases, including those over blue water, where they are doing, uh, uh, where you're uh, ferrying an airplane, say, from here to Iceland or something. Uh, banner towers have quite a number of ditching incidents, and they are not always the most prepared for them. Uh, so that happens a lot. Uh, we were surprised that to learn that you most likely won't flip over, even if you're in a tail dragger. And uh, usually there's plenty of time to egress the airplane. It's not a sudden sink emergency. You've got, you've got some time to uh, kind of collect your thoughts and, and uh, get out of the plane. So uh, high wings and low wings seem to be no big difference in ditching success. And plenty of twins ditch also, which uh, we, we thought was sort of interesting information. And one of the other things you have to prep for, of course, is the Bermuda Triangle. You do fly over the Bermuda Triangle on the way to the Bahamas. So as you can see, we were well prepared. <laughs> you might take any chances. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk real quickly about what uh, the technical requirements are for going to the Bahamas. US passport, radio station license, your restricted radio operator's license, your EPIS manifest filed online, your international flight plan, your medical and basic med is okay for the Bahamas, US Coast Guard approved life jackets and your non-owned use authorization, um, form C7A cruising permit and the Bahamas uh, travel health visa, which is a new item due to COVID. Yep. So uh, the, the items with the asterisks, um, we had all that stuff and they never asked us for those. So uh, radio station license, my airplane already had one. Restricted radio operator's license, you can get you can get online and get one of those in about five minutes. And I think it costs fifteen dollars. Um, they didn't ask ever to look at our medicals. We both had current medicals. Um, so the non-owned use authorization. What that means is that if your airplane is in, is in an LLC or you're renting an airplane, you need to have a letter from whoever owns that airplane that says, hey, it's OK for Alexander to fly my airplane to the Bahamas and uh, or, or whoever. And uh, and they did. They uh, supposedly will look at that, although they did not look at that in our case either. And we'll show you a picture of the cruising <laughs> permit here in a minute. But basically, the cruising permit is kind of like a little mini passport that you take around with you as you're. Uh, as you're going through the uh, the uh, islands. And uh, as Laura mentioned, uh, the new thing, the Bahamas Travel Health Visa, uh, we'll talk about their website in a minute, but, um, but that is now uh, something you have to fill out and meet the requirements of before you can travel to the Bahamas. So that uh, cruising permit, probably not really big on your screen, kind of looks like this. It's sort of like an old passport. Um, everywhere you go that has somebody there with a stamp, they will stamp it. Now we landed plenty of places where they didn't even look at us uh, or talk to us, and uh, and some of the some of the places were private, some of them weren't. But anytime it's a bigger airport, um, you, the, you'll uh, you'll get a stamp that says you came and went, even if it's several times during the day. It, it's required. It is required, but they don't always do it. <laughs> <laughs> so the official website is uh, Bahamas.com, and I have to say. Uh, although I haven't spent a lot of time on a lot of countries' websites, uh, it is one of the most easy to use uh, websites I've seen in a long time. Great, great. Uh, talks about all the things you can do there. A lot of general aviation information, everything you need to know about flying there. One of the things uh, I had some questions and I can't even remember what it was about. I was a little confused about the paperwork or something. And I used their online chat system and got an immediate uh, response from a person who uh, very clearly understood what I was trying to do and uh, it, was, it was really very helpful. So uh, there's great information about there, about where to go and what to see. And that is the place where you go to apply for your travel health visa. So technically required to return to the US, you will need your US passport your EPIS manifest 
filed online. Which let me say something about that. So there's a, a kind of a nifty little app called Flash Pass, which makes the whole EPIS thing really EAPIS, however you want to pronounce it. It is the <laughs> Electronic Advanced Passenger Information System. So uh, it makes that really easy to do. Uh, you just kind of hit a couple buttons and it files it for you. Your international flight plan, U.S. Coast Guard approved life jackets. And you, you can use the same life jackets that were required <laughs> on the way in, on the way back too, just so you, know, you don't have to get new ones. Your current U.S. custom sticker. So the uh, interesting, I'm gonna stop on the custom sticker real quick. You'll notice <laughs> that it has an asterisk on it. We applied for that sticker three months in advance. It never showed up. We um, we took our receipt. They suggested they take we take our receipt with us and that would help us get back in the country if, to prove that we had bought the custom sticker. They didn't even look, for, look at the receipt. So <laughs> anyway, we did finally get the... Uh, get the sticker and then of course the other thing is uh one of the other things you got to have that negative, negative COVID, covid test, test. and which all the resorts and everything are offering that sort of stuff now um and uh oops yeah so the port of entry the poe uh, in our case which was uh fort, fort pierce, pierce is you have to call to schedule that arrival uh before you come in but they were very accommodating and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute so things that are not required, but mandatory for us. Uh, we rented a raft uh, at that time. It was about $170 per week. Well worth, it's very small, compact, perfect. Uh, make sure your insurance covers the Bahamas, both your health insurance and your aircraft insurance. Uh, satellite tracker in reach. Um, as you can see in the picture to the right, we had ours sitting right there on the dash. Even though we really had great cell service the whole time we were over there, um, it, we've all, we pretty much always run the inReach wherever we go. We just thought it was a good idea to have it on that trip too. Uh, Seatbelt cutters, we actually had two. You can see it again in that picture just to the left on the upper part of the panel. We had two seatbelt cutters attached there. So God forbid we did ditch, we could both get ourselves out. Uh, a dry go bag to keep all of our documents, phones and et cetera. So I'm going to stop and talk about this for just a second because Laura and I are not particularly disciplined people. <laughs> um, it's fair to say, and and we uh, we actually did a really good job of putting all of our every time we'd stop or before we take off, we'd put our phones, all of our paper, and everything in one of these bags and roll it up and stick it behind, between the seats where we could grab it. And uh, we actually it was, it was surprising how uh, how well we did with that. <laughs> Uh, and and we and we wear our self-inflating vests at all times. Anytime we went off in the plane, even when we were down there flying from island to island, we had the vests on. Uh, we've often heard, you know, this the, the anything that you have on you is survival gear. Anything in the back is camping gear. Well, we kind of took that to heart on this trip. So one of the things I did, the, the manufacturer suggested that you test out these vests. So. We, we manually inflated all three of these vests and we had three, I don't know if I got a three pack or a special of three or whatever <laughs> it was. I had some old inflatable vests from like Stern's vest, but I started reading about them and they weren't really Coast Guard approved. Um, so we manually inflated these and let them sit for 40 hours and they were still perfectly solid after 40 hours of uh, inflation. And then I just deflated them. Um, so that, you know, it's kind of was in the fine print that the manufacturer said that you suggest that I would have never have thought of it. I'd have probably been the guy that would have just pulled the plug and then it would have had a big leak in and it would have been a really <laughs> short float. <laughs> well, we did bring all three with us. You know, obviously we wore two. We had a spare in case something happened to one. So let's go. You can see on the right, we have our stuff packed in there behind the cargo net. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're worried about ditching, having your gear secured is probably a good idea. Yes, and we had lovely weather when we left. <laughs> we, uh, hey, we, we're not going to complain. We had a big tailwind. <laughs> we did. We had a really big tailwind. So one of the things we thought about on this trip, you'll hear us talk a little bit more about as we go along. So the Cessna 180 that we flew has a P-Punk engine in it. And if you run it at 24 squared, it uses a lot of gas for the amount of speed you get out of it. So we actually went out and did some practicing with uh, reduced fuel and our uh, reduced power and RPM settings, just to see what we could do, uh, what our what our 
you know, best distance type things were knowing that fuel was going to be limited availability in the Bahamas. And uh, we actually made it from um, Kansas City to Sorry. Atlanta. Coast Atlanta, yeah. Yeah, and still had quite a bit of fuel remaining uh, just by powering back and having an awesome tailwind. Uh, Alexander just asked what uh, we, we went in March of 2019 was when this trip was. And uh, so it was really cold in Kansas City when we left. Not as cold as it is here right now in Arkansas. Yeah, I was going to say, with this weather out here now, we have an ice storm going on. So if our yeah. power goes yeah. out, it's not us. <laughs> this presentation ends in the middle. It's the ice storm. So, We're ready to anyway. go again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so, so those are some of the considerations that we had, uh, both for fuel and that sort of stuff. And as you can see, I'm flying, and that should be the first indication that there's going to be a problem. So <laughs> as we were about 10 <laughs> miles from, uh, from uh, staying with Lou and Kathy Furlong, who, live, who lived at the time in the north, uh, east, or northeastern part of Atlanta, um, the alternator light went on and uh, said it was no longer charging. So we uh, limped over to their house, and for the next 24 hours, <laughs> Uh, Lou and I spent working, figuring out how to get the alternator back online. Lou's a very handy guy. If you're ever going to break down, just be sure to break down wherever he is and you'll find it a lot easier. <laughs> so um, one of the part. other things, yeah. <laughs> the good the, part about being near Atlanta. <laughs> one of the good things about being in Atlanta <laughs> is you have aircraft spruce. So we jumped in Lou's 180 and uh, flew right over the top of Hartsfeld there, you can see, and downtown. It was a Sunday morning very early. And, and Spruce was open, so we went down there and picked up some parts, not all of which we used, but, uh, but it was nice to know that they were nearby. Also, it's really handy to um, have a, uh, a consultant available from, uh, that works on alternators. So we had a consultant that we spoke with. And no, it was not the feed, field wire, believe me. <laughs> um, so uh, we had a consultant that uh, helped us with the alternator and we got things back online. So it was very good. It's also really nice that Lou has friends with really nice hangers uh, right a couple doors down from his house that we could work on the plane on. So it was a, a really pleasant place to work on it uh, while we were getting that straightened out. So. Uh, well, yeah. after after a 24 hour downtime, we uh, we packed up the plane and hit the air. We were going to try to get down to Fort Pierce or actually our friends had shifted down to Miami because weather was kind of be kind of iffy. And oh, Fort that Pierce. actually was Sunday morning. That was Sunday. It was morning. Saturday morning that we went to. The, yeah. Yeah. So that was Sunday, Sunday morning. Sunday morning. We left Atlanta Sunday morning. So we were going to meet them in Fort Pierce and hop over to uh, the Bahamas. On Sunday. On Sunday. And so we thought. And so uh, as we were traveling down that way. About a half um, hour out of loose. We were, it's probably more <laughs> like an hour out of Atlanta. We are, uh, our oil pressure dropped to the very bottom of the green arc. And then when we reduced power, you can see where it dropped down even further. So um, <laughs> this was all exciting. I was not flying this time. <laughs> it was all very exciting. And as you can see out there with a the nice swampy land that we were flying over. And, and of course it was scud. low. Yeah, it was low visibility. So we weren't flying very high. Uh, but uh, we looked at the, uh, the um, CHTs and EGTs and the oil temperature and all of those things were still normal. So we hoped and kind of assumed it was some sort of an indicator error. We landed at the uh, Lake City, Florida airport, and there was a really helpful guy that came out that happened to have a 520 sitting on his bench. And he said, here's the oil pressure relief valve. You probably got a piece of junk underneath that. That's probably what caused it. Don't worry too much about it. Super knowledgeable about engines. He was awesome. He jumped in the plane and flew around the patch with me. And then he, I said, uh, I said, what, well, what would you do? And he said, I'd fly this plane to the Bahamas. <laughs> so, so that's what we did. <laughs> anyway, so uh, there we go. So, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty worn out now. We've had this alternator saga where, where I certainly haven't gotten a lot of sleep and was pulling what little hair I had left out. And, uh, and then this oil pressure things happened. So pretty frazzled. And, and I will say that initially we were not going to get a raft totally changed our tune <laughs> yeah we weren't going to get we weren't going to get a raft and, and so we hadn't we hadn't reserved one and you do need to reserve one if you're planning on getting one so we decide and our friends have gone down to miami, to miami to avoid weather and ended up not staying in fort pierce where we were all going to work where we were all going to meet up well the weather straightened around in fort pierce so we ended up going there 
and uh, spending the night there after all that, just to get a good night's sleep and then planning on heading out on Monday morning to yeah. meet them. Custom closes at five on the Bahamas. So if we had left, we were going to get there maybe at 4.30, who knew? And it was just too close for comfort. So, so customs closes at five and there's no VFR night flying on the Bahamas either. So, uh, so you have to kind of keep those two things in, in mind. And the IFR flying in the Bahamas, we won't go into great deal, detail about, but I understand it is you pretty much just create your own approach is what I've heard. <laughs> so if you can imagine a lot of people out there doing that, because there's, there's not really any towers except on the, the really big main airports. So here's a little view of what it looked like uh, Monday morning. Uh, Monday morning. Now, <laughs> our original plan was to climb to six or seven thousand feet on this bright sunny day with three other airplanes. With three other airplanes <laughs> with us, and uh, we would uh, the skies would be clear. There'd be dozens and dozens of boats down there we could land by if we needed to. But this is how it looked instead. So here we're uh, under the clouds at about 600, 700 feet off the water, and uh, there's some thunderstorms on the right and left which you can't really see. And we're just kind of sneaking through there. And at that altitude, the approach frequency doesn't work for very long. Um, they were really nice, so they right. stayed with us. But it's only it's only about a 70 mile flight. So we get it in our heads that it's this great distance. It's only about 70 miles from uh, from uh, uh, Palm Beach from Palm Beach to the Bahamas. It's about 100 the way we went from Fort Pierce. But the uh, Southern White House TFR was in effect then, so we had to go around that uh, Palm Beach uh, TFR. And um, so anyway, it turned out to be a real, really nice flight over. It was very smooth, beautiful views of the islands. And uh, uh, we chose, you'll see the route a little later that we used on the way back, but we chose just to fly from island to island. So we'd go to the closest island and then fly to the next one. And that was part of the sightseeing plan anyway. So here we are at North Eleuthera. That was our first actual stop in the Bahamas, clearing customs here and getting fuel. This, of course, as Steve mentioned, we have short legs in that airplane. So um, North Eleuthera has fuel. Cat Island, which was our des uh, final destination where we were going to be, um, there was no fuel anywhere on the island. Now, you could get some car gas, um, but, you, but there was no uh, aviation fuel on that island, even though there were some airports there. Um, yeah, typical Caribbean weather, exactly. <laughs> so uh, that's just a shot of that. So here's the customs building and the FBO, and you'll see they're in the same building. Apparently at, at some places in the Bahamas, the customs is at one end of the airport, and then you have to taxi all the way to the other end of the airport to get fuel. So this was very convenient. Um, super nice folks, real easy. They want you to fill out the immigration forms in advance if you can, but it's not a big deal. You can do it right there on site. It's very easy to do. So uh, we just found all all of the interactions with everybody there very pleasant and uh, and and really easy. And here's our home for the week, New Bite Airport in South Cat Island. So this is about 327 miles from Fort Pierce, uh, nautical miles, if you fly nonstop or direct, not nonstop, but direct. So um, so we, of course, took a little more circuitous, circuitous route to get down there. And um, they, um, yeah, so that's the, uh, that was it, it's 327 miles. So New Byte, <laughs> uh, the airport, the uh, New Byte Airport is right about a half a mile or three quarters of a mile from the resort that we stayed at. And uh, you got to bring your own tie downs and you need the kind Dirty ones. <laughs> yeah, you need the kind that you can hammer into coral because all these islands are made of coral <laughs> or and uh, you got to be able to smash them into coral and uh, fly ties is what I happen to have and those worked pretty well in that situation. Some other folks had some other stuff and those worked good too. So the other thing you run into, you can't see it really great in this picture because I shot it when I was on short final to New Bite. There are always reminders about being in, in the Bahamas, about being careful in aviation. So like there's an airplane just right off the end of the runway, just kind of clunked in over here. Uh, there's another one that's like a DC-3 when you're on final. One of these islands, oh, yeah. it's, a, it's either a beach 18 or a DC-3 or yeah. in the Exumas. That you just you look down and final, it's underwater down there. So that, some of that is kind of fun. Uh, but, but a good reminder. And then most of the airports have some things like this sitting around. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, 
I don't know the story, but from the looks of it, the uh, left gear on this Baron collapsed as uh, the other prop still looks like it's in pretty good shape. Um, but uh, so you see some of these kinds of things. These, these were not flying by the time we left. It looked like it'd been a few years since they'd been in the air. <laughs> so uh, we stayed at the Fernandez Bay Resort, which is an aviator owned resort. Uh, again, about three quarters of a mile from the airport. They give you a $300 uh, discount in the Bahamas. It's a tourism discount if you fly yourself down there. So they very much encourage general aviation. And this was just a picture we shot. I think I took this with my cell phone. Just what kind of what every night looked like there. This, it was yeah. beautiful. This was uh, where we had our dinner every night. And the routine was you'd go down, you self-serve cocktails. You write down what you're making yourself, a uh, sheet. And then, you know, every night you just write in paper and then at the end of the week, you settle up with the resort. We have our cocktails, watch the sunset. And when the sunset was the cue to go sit at your table and they'd bring out your food. And it was just, it was just amazing. This was a little tough to take. I'm just going to tell you. This was our walk every morning, every afternoon. We, we are, um, where's your little mouse? Our cabin. cabin was way at the end of this curved beach, way at the other end. So we'd walk down for dinner because dinner was right about where we were standing. We'd have our dinner. The sun would set. The moon would come out. We'd walk back through the moonlight. It was just amazing. It was really nice. It was just stunning. Now, we originally did this program for uh, mm -hmm. folks up in Minnesota. And, uh, and we, you know, we wanted to make sure if they went down there that they would feel welcome. So there are there are some special ambassadors in the Bahamas that come out right about dusk, not for too long. They're not the ferocious variety in Minnesota or Alaska and a little bit of bug spray or even some cinnamon on the table, which is what they often put on yeah. the tables there will uh, we'll, we'll drive them away. But the no seams are definitely around there. So you have a few 30 minutes of slapping all over yourself to try to get rid of them. I had never heard of the cinnamon thing and it did work. It was amazing. It doesn't smell bad either. So this is a, a landing into Norman Key, and uh, just one of the islands. So this is the Exumas, and uh, we're the Exumas. Of course, is just a chain of a lot of little islands, and it's just spectacular to fly over. You see the, the you know, the the, the, the GoPro sand. does do the color of the water and this justice. It's really a. Yeah. It's like move your head, Steve. Move your head. Yeah. Move your head, Steve. <laughs> so, uh, these runways are all really long. They're very nicely paved. All the ones that we landed on are really nice paved runways. And they're in the direction of the land, which means they're all a big crosswind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are definitely some serious crosswinds up there that we encountered, and uh, um, but it was all good. So in this case, where we're where we're getting out of the plane is clear at the other end of the airport. Uh, and that's where we're going to get out and do some walking. So uh, I think that when the, the film stops, probably when I smack <laughs> into the ground and the camera probably broke or something, but uh, so we end up going to the other end. That never happens. <laughs> so this is our group. Um, and you, you may know a lot of these characters, the Metzlers and uh, Mike Perkins, Lynn Merrith and Hank and Linda Four, and uh, just a really good group of folks to travel with. And uh, so we got out of the planes here and walked uh, probably a mile or two miles around to a lovely little place to have dinner or lunch and uh, with an incredible view I spent a little time walking around on the beach there it was really a pretty cool. this is a view where we're sitting at their dining room table this is just a little view out the window there then we did some more touring around uh, did, did a tour of the full length of the exumas and uh, this is farmer's key it's actually a private airstrip uh, there's really not much there but this little bar there's a little bar right in the middle of it and some sharks Lots and a volleyball sharks. net. And, uh, um, but that was about it. So it was kind of a neat, neat place to stop. You can walk down to the beach and the little sharks are just swimming out along the shoreline. It's like, yeah, okay, I think I'll go swimming here. <laughs> so um, we uh, jumped in a car one day on Cat Island, decided we would explore the whole island because the airport up at Port Arthur, which is north, 
uh, northern part of the island uh, was closed during that time period. And we wanted to kind of go up there and check things out. So as you're driving along, there's all these neat little uh, things like the bat cave, which <laughs> turned out to really not have any bats in it, but it had a, like a million wasps. So it wasn't that good to go in there. Um, and then uh, you got to watch out for some of the natives. Uh, these uh, the, There's goats in the road. And there's also potholes large enough to swallow any size vehicle. Uh, that, that's kind of the, the way they, the, the roads are crushed coral with a little layer on top of them and they... Uh, and when you have eight adults in one vehicle, you feel every one of those yeah. bumps. <laughs> it was a eight adults in like a five person vehicle. So it was a, it was a stretch. It's a good thing we liked bit. each other. Yeah. So, uh, so that made it kind of interesting. But uh, the trip was rewarding to get up to the northern part of the island. Um, and a uh, place up there, a lot of you may be familiar with, called Shanna's Cove. Uh, is a resort up there, and, and a short hike, or maybe a mile and a half hike from there, gets you out to Man of War Point, which is a spectacular beach. And, the, and it's quite diverse, too. I mean, you go into this little forest, and there's all these little crabs running around, and then all of a sudden, you pop out in this stunning beach. It was very nice. Then you go back up to the Shanna's Cove for lunch. And, uh, and a local beer. Right. And, <laughs> and the Shannon's Cove restaurant is the highest restaurant in the Bahamas. It's 80 feet MSL. <laughs> so of all the Bahamas, it's the highest one. And uh, yeah, so pretty neat place. And if you do go to Shannon's Cove, you're going to want the Wi-Fi code. Now, I actually fell for this. I asked, I said to the lady, what's the Wi-Fi code? She says, I don't know. I said, uh, well, who does know? I don't know. Well, what's the Wi-Fi? Is, so obviously the Wi-Fi code is actually, I, I don't, don't know. know. And <laughs> so, so they have a lot of fun with that there. So just, this is a save you a little embarrassment. This is good. Now <laughs> you have this information. And I talked to somebody recently and I'll have to look and see if by chance she made it on here. Britt Lincoln uh, was uh, uh, just recently in the Bahamas and I got a little information from her about what it was like. She was picking up a new airplane and flying it home today. So I'll have to check the list of folks and see if she's there. Uh, but she was, she, they stayed at Shanna's and, and she had some additional information as well, too. Uh, a lot of people don't know the White House is in the Bahamas. <laughs> and uh, so that's just an important point. Uh, one of the other excursions we took, um, we actually um, got a cab and had a, um, the driver was a school, the head of the school headmaster yeah, of the school. Old, old school headmaster. And he was so knowledgeable. It was so much fun. He took us to this, the highest point of the Bahamas, which is this, the Hermitage. It was a, uh, a building built by a Roman Catholic priest who was his getaway, basically. Um, really cool, um, interesting place and stunning view. Um, it's the highest point of the Bahamas at 206 feet. <laughs> yeah, really, really neat history there. But he also took us, well, I guess that's just, well, I'll show you the other place he took us in a little while. We're not, we're jumping over it. So uh, we went down to uh, the New Bite Cultural Center, they call it, which is kind of their little center of town. And there were all these little shacks that uh, served all kinds of different food. And the one we went to, which was highly recommended to us, I think Alan and Jill had been there uh -huh. before, was amazing. Some of the best food we had on the trip. And, and it's just the sketchiest little place you've ever seen. So, so don't be and, afraid to do some of that. And I don't believe any of us got sick. So yeah. it, was, it was really good, real yeah. fresh, right out, of the, right out of the ocean. But this is, that was it. <laughs> so one of the other places that the um, headmaster took us was this deep pool, blue pool? Blue hole. Blue holes. They're, you tell them what they are. <laughs> well, so basically it's a hole that goes out to the ocean. Right, so it's in the middle of the island, uh, but it's a very deep hole that goes out and connects out to the kind, ocean. You can kind of see the layers of coral that kind of come out below the water. It's crystal clear. Just there was supposed to be one by uh, our uh, resort that we were staying at, but uh, for some reason I don't know what was going on with it. But he says, "Well, I'll take you to this other one. It's a very short walk." He said, it's, "I said, how much of a walk is it?" He says, "It's about a quarter mile." Well, about two <laughs> miles into it, I said. How many more quarter miles are we going to be going here? And he goes, he says, I knew if I told you it was more than a quarter mile, you weren't going to want to go and you're going to want to see this. So anyway, it was, so, beautiful. Uh, it was very nice. So, uh, you know, um, Avgas is, uh, you know, at the time we were there in 2019, it was 
$7 a gallon for Avgas and $6.98 for car gas. Now, I just read on the uh, Bahama.com website that, that they're saying Avgas is like $5.35. I would want to uh, double check that if you were budgeting for Avgas. I'd want to double check that before I uh, committed to it. At the time we were there, the exchange rate was one to one. I think that's pretty typical of the Bahamas that that's always the case. But uh, so I don't know if that's changed at all. So some random tidbits. So there's no weather radar on your ADSB over in the Bahamas. So if you dumped your satellite subscription like I did, <laughs> and, and there's thunderstorms around, your ADSB works about 20 miles off the shore, and then you're done. So that's all you that's all you get. Cell service is good, but check with your provider if not Verizon or et cetera. So the only thing about the cell service, um, we met a guy that uh, had sold his business and was living on a sailboat with his family, and they came into shore to get better internet because their satellite was, was uh, they weren't getting good satellite and the cell networks by the Exumas were so jammed up that they actually came over to other islands to use the cell towers over there because so many people were using the data on the cell network. So the cell networks can be busy. We didn't have any problems with calls or texts or anything like that. And especially on Cat Island. Yeah. Uh, don't forget to open and close your flight plans. Yep. Uh, not all airports have fuel. And not all islands have fuel. <laughs> uh, it's $50 to enter, enter the country per aircraft and $29 per person to exit. Which is kind of interesting. <laughs> and $3.18 per day tie down at <laughs> New Byte Airport. <laughs> but that's if you bring your own tie down. So I don't know if it's another 25 cents or what, but and we, we don't know how they arrived at that number, but, but that's the number. And lastly, both NASA and Freeport have increased crime and also increased COVID. So yeah, where? those are the kind of the high risk areas. And, and while we're on that subject real quick, because I did a little bit of research <laughs> right now, the Bahamas have are considered by the CDC, CDC to have a slightly less uh, COVID risk than even Florida. So uh, not, not, a, uh, not the worst place you could go. Uh, but certainly, you know, higher from, from that standpoint. And they are trying to be very careful over there uh, because obviously tourism is all they got. Um, another important point, uh, which we did not rent a boat or go with a boat operator, but none of the boat operators in the Bahamas, no matter how big their boat are, are regulated in any way. So you kind of need to do the <laughs> diligence to know that it's just, if it's just Bob with his bought the John boat yesterday that he's taking you out fishing on, or if it's somebody that's very good. So it's good to get some local knowledge about that sort of stuff. So in the picture on the right here, you'll see Mike and Hank sitting with all of our four sky wagons <laughs> full of crap. Actually three, because Alan and Jill weren't leaving. Oh, that's right. That's only oh three, my gosh, that's only, that's only three of us. That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're loaded up and going up to the airport to head out and Picture on the left, Hank and Linda are signing out for the last time at the uh, Eleuthera um, Customs Station. So this is the route um, that we used uh, coming back. And uh, again, we kind of, we, we, I plotted these points and then I kind of followed the islands along um, really for sightseeing as much as anything. And it was just kind of a neat way to go. So you can see the total 472 nautical miles for us to get to. Uh, we ended up over in Marco Island to stay with some friends of, of ours over there. So uh, that added, uh, you know, a fair hundred miles to the trip, but, uh, but also really a, uh, really a neat but it was a, it was a good route and you can see the tfr there around the southern white house yeah so <laughs> you had to avoid that at that time so fort pierce customs when we came back in the country uh again really wonderful uh experience they didn't ask for our for our custom sticker they actually allow the fuel trucks to come over and fuel in the customs area which is really nice a lot of places don't do that you have to get in your plane taxi out they let us uh they let us leave our our plane there while we uh, ran over and did some other things in the fbo so it's very accommodating they're they're accustomed to people coming and going all the time 
And uh, just, I would really, if we went again, we'd absolutely go through Fort Pierce. We did, we, we never went through a different port and there may be some other great ones, but we had such a good experience here that we would, uh, we would go back that way. Why mess it up trying somewhere else? <laughs> well, we told you there would be sharks. <laughs> So we saw lots of sharks while we were flying. Um, and, and they don't look really that big until you see them next to a boat. <laughs> yeah. So when you go, I mean, literally, we'd fly along and Lord go, there's a shark, there's a shark, there's another shark. And, uh, and I was so, like, oh my God, there's one near a boat. Look how big it is. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting some great comments here. Um, so uh, here's a little spot uh, on the southern part of cat island where the fishermen come in at the end of the day and they drop off all of the what's re remaining of their fish so the sharks tend to can congregate over here we were here too early in the day to see that so we picked up some hot dogs and something else i don't even know something else that sharks don't they, like they, they didn't don't like they hot didn't dogs but the interesting thing is i mean we're standing on this dock and there's no rail there's nothing i mean if somebody bumped you and you're in that water you're toast <laughs> yeah it's, it's a little more uh you need it's a, it's a, it's a little more libertarian perspective out there. <laughs> you're on your own you got to protect yourself yeah. so so just be let the buyer beware but, yeah you uh, can see us all we're all holding on to these posts just in case <laughs> yeah. and and you know nobody thought about the fact that one of those sharks might jump up and grab us but no we were pretty high up yeah. it, that would be that would be a stretch anyway. <laughs> So um, here's Mike uh, waving goodbye. And uh, we, uh, w that's about all we've got for this program. I'm gonna flip over and let you uh, watch a little of this flight through the Exumas while we're talking. We're happy to take some questions. If anybody, I'm gonna pop up the chat box here and see if there's anything, uh, anything going on here. Let's see. Uh... <laughs> Excellent comments, everyone. <laughs> Yes, we weren't worried about sharks. We did have a raft. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, Lou wanted me to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, how the fuel savings and speed. And I don't remember all the exact numbers, but in this plane, the, the sort of the sweet spot was about 2000 RPM and 21 inches of manifold pressure. And I got a pretty good cross of speed and, uh, and fuel savings, the mile per gallon miles per gallon really went up. Big tailwind helped. Yeah, but, uh, but, <laughs> but well, we that, that wasn't helping with it, yeah. Yeah, we flew so nonstop there from Kansas City to Atlanta, basically. Yep, so that, that was, was nice. a very, uh, so that was a, was a very good uh, thing. So what was in our toolkit? Oh. I think there were some bottles. <laughs> yeah. Now we had, I did take, I did take a, a, just a little bag of tools along with just the, you know, the safety wire and those kinds of things. And just about any, anything super major. I will say that it doesn't, we didn't have any major uh, problems over there, but it's not a place that I'd necessarily want to break down in. I'd want to make sure your plane was in pretty good shape. Um, you know, it's, it wouldn't be a good place to do a ground loop and need to rebuild a wing or something like that. It would get real expensive real fast. And uh, remember the, uh, hey, Hank, thanks. <laughs> the, uh, um, in fact, <laughs> you want, Hank, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute you, and let you say a few <laughs> words. How does that sound? Let's see if I can find him on here. Dun, 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 dun. All right, Hank. Hey, hey hello, guys. everybody. Thanks for the memories. <laughs> I can't hear them. That's all right. Speak um, up. No. What did I leave out? Uh, can you hear us? Yep. Oh, yeah. You didn't leave a thing out, actually. So <laughs> wonderful trip, man, and great photos and video. And you're right, a lot of sharks and other critters that we saw out there. But um, the alcohol was good, and the weather actually it was absolutely fabulous the whole time we was there so um best time to go whenever we went when was that anyway i can't remember anymore. that was march, march. of 2019 that's right 2019 yeah let's do it again yeah that's i think trip. we're about due <laughs> i agree was and, uh, my, my, my thing is it was easier than we thought it would be that's the first time we've been in bahamas and the flight planning yeah you gotta go through that but i uh in my opinion once you get understand the customs of the APIS and stuff like that. It was actually pretty easy and everyone was very accommodating at all the ports of entry and exits and 
and airports, they've kind of been over backwards, you know, to get you to your accommodations and back to the airport and those type of things. And I tell you, it's, uh, uh, we're ready to go again, you know, unfortunately. Go well, ahead. But, but, I, but I understand that I'm going to be, we're going to be flying along by ourselves because you got your engine fixed and now you can keep up with those other sky wagons. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. That's all you guys know, actually. You can just throw us a tow rope. Yeah, that's funny. Well, great to see you both, and thanks for hanging out here tonight. Yeah. Well, folks. Great to put that on. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Well, folks, that's about all we've got for this evening. If there's there any no questions? any other questions, I'm going to have one quick look. <laughs> and uh, thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. And uh, next week, there's nothing. So next week is, um, oh yeah, no, there was no evidence of salt exposure on the planes, at least that, that I saw. We didn't, we didn't have any problem with that at all. Um, so next week is a bye week. Uh, originally we had something else planned that we had to do and that canceled, so we don't have anybody. But at the week <laughs> after that is uh, Amy Hoover, a uh, backcountry uh, doctor. Uh, we'll be uh, we're talking about her book and talking about the uh, basics of flying the backcountry. Uh, the week after that, George Campbell is actually back to talk about float flying, and uh, he's got a lot of experience in that, going to do that. And then the next week after that, we have Mark Scott talking about a really cool program of building uh, a high school kids building an RV, a Vans RV that he put together at the high school and actually got it flying. So it's be a really neat uh, really neat set of stuff. So uh, we won't see you next week. Feel free to watch something on television or whatever. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll catch you all here in uh, a couple weeks. Thanks again, everybody. Night.